Good evening, Dr. Stephenson. Um, will you tell me the correct way to pronounce your name? Wilhelmer. The accent's on the first syllable. Wilhelmer. 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 Well, this is as close as I'm going to come, I expect. to William. Um, you were born Wilhelmer Stephenson, and uh, you were born in Canada. Well, I may have been baptized William Stevenson. Uh, people were busy then Americanizing or anglicizing their names, and my parents were told that uh, an Icelandic name um, would be difficult to pronounce and they were advised to call themselves Stevenson. And uh, I was probably baptized William Stevenson. So that uh, if I have difficulty with the name, I could say Bill Stevenson. Yes, my, some of my oldest friends say that. They do? Still. Mm. And your connection now with Canada began with birth, and then you moved to the United States when you were quite young, returned later? Um, I lived in the United States from 1881 until I began my polar work in 1906. And the polar work lasted for how long, sir? I've spent in the uh, Arctic or north of the Arctic Circle about 10 winters and 13 summers. And you've had quite uh, an extensive uh, contact with Canada over the years in addition to that? Oh, yes. I always belonged to the Canadian clubs, uh, any school or city that I lived in. I've always been uh, kind of bi-national. I see. United States and Canada. And uh, didn't you recently have uh, still another contact with uh, the head of our government? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, a great triumph for the college that I'm connected with, Dartmouth College, that um, uh, our new prime minister, Canadian prime minister, made his first official visit to uh, Dartmouth, and he was gracious enough to ask my wife and me to uh, meet him. And you had some time with Mr. Diefenbaker at that? About 40 minutes. Did you? Mm -hmm. We expected about 10, and so we made about 30 minute profit. <laughs> and uh, did you talk about the Arctic? He, we reminisced. Uh, actually, uh, he uh, said he remembered uh, seeing me on the platform in 1913. And uh, he had apparently kept a good deal of track of what we've been doing up north. I see. Um, you, uh, he had heard you speak then about your explorations. Yes, in 1913 was when I was organizing my third expedition. So he must have heard uh, something about that. And when was the date of that, uh, well, of the three expeditions, sir? My first expedition was 1906-1907, a year and a half. Yes. The second expedition was 1908 to 12, four years and a half consecutively. And the third one was 1913 to 18, five and a half years. Five and a half years without a break? Yes, in those the, were all without breaks. I see. And then this, this was the end of your polar exploring? Uh, yes, during the war I did some uh, advisory work for the United States Air Forces. This is World War II. World War II. And uh, then um, I've been a guest, my wife and I were guests of the Canadian government, I mean the Danish government, up in Greenland. Oh, so you have made a couple of recent return visits. Yes, as it but were. she's been doing better than I. She flew over the North Pole the other day. Did she? Which oh. I never did, of course. Did you ever get there, sir? No, I never tried. Now, why was that? Well, it appeared he had found it long before me. <laughs> and. Uh, I've often been asked that, and I coined the answer that I'm a scientist and not a tourist. I see. Um, <clears throat> you say that uh, you finished your polar exploring, formally as it were, in 1918? 1918, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, why did you never go back, Dr. Stephenson? Well, I, um, it seemed to me that uh, I, 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 I wanted to try to dispel uh, from the uh, world, the same misconceptions which I had of the Arctic when I went north. Yeah. Uh, I used to think that I was well informed on the Arctic before I went north, uh, and, uh, but I concluded eventually that out of uh, ten things that I believed about the Arctic before I went north, about six were wrong. I was about 60 percent either partly or wholly wrong, and uh, during my first year in the Arctic, 
I kept a careful diary, and I'm now in disagreement with over half of what I wrote in my own diary. Is that things that I thought I'd seen and the meanings that I deduced. So that preconceptions affect everyone then? Well, it did me. <laughs> affect you? How long then does it take? Uh, how much experience does one have to have be before you can see things as they are in the Arctic? Well, it comes gradually. Your eyes are gradually. Uh, you see everything through the colored spectacles of your education you're bringing up. Mm -hmm. And the color of those spectacles it fades only gradually. I think the very last year I was there, I was still being undeceived. You were still there. If I had <coughs> stayed longer, I could have unlearned still more. Mm. Well, you're, you're talking to someone now who is replete with all the standard prejudices. How long would it take me or anyone like me to begin, at least, to get a reasonable grasp of, of the art? Well, I should think that you shouldn't publish anything until you've been there more than one year. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the impressions you get during the, your first year in the Arctic are, uh, in my experience, they were more often wrong than right. Mm -hmm. Well, this means then that you've tilted at a good many standardized windmills in the course of your life. Yes, my books are full of that. And this, I take it, too, has involved you in a good deal of controversy. Uh, yes, um, especially as to the uh, nature of the uh, Canadian North. At the end of my three expeditions, I was um, invited by the um, Rotary Clubs of Canada and the Canadian Clubs jointly to make a cross-continent tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, my theme was that Canada is now a colonized or settled fringe on the northern frontier of the United States. Yes. But I thought that it, Canada is potentially as deep from south to north as it is wide from east to west, and that Canada would never be a really first-class nation until Canadians took that point of view and tried to make use of their entire territories. And that led me into a lot of argument. I'm sure it would. How far north is Canada habitable? Uh, as far north as there is any Canada. Right up? Right up to the north tip of Ellesmere Island. And Ellesmere Island is? That's the most northerly Canadian island. Oh, yes. It's just in, uh, uh, Greenland is the only land that's more northerly. And there's not very much difference actually between? Not much between. difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, Greenland was inhabited by Eskimos. Uh, about the time of Columbus, uh, I think that there were a good many Eskimos. I on the see. north tip of Greenland. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I believe, uh, northern Ellesmere Island was also inhabited. So that there, there has been habitation right up. And there, there are some islands where no habitation has yet been discovered. But I think that probably Eskimos were in all the Canadian islands, formerly. At one time or at another? At one time. And is this equally possible, then, for Canadians, North Americans, Oh, generally? yes, they're ordinary human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, uh, the adaptation that you need uh, for um, enjoying the North is mostly in your field, uh, Professor Williams, in the field of psychology. There's it's no mostly physiological a adaptation? The, uh, the, the, uh, if you distinguish between physiology and psychology, mm -hmm. then the um, physiological adaptation which is possible is negligible. But there's great room for mental adaptation. This is dispelling the stereotypes yes. and so on. Uh, what you need is uh, sociological and psychological change. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need inventions. You need good clothing, uh, especially good clothing and good housing. Uh, fortunately, Eskimos invented the best clothing that man has ever had in the North is Eskimo clothing, and the best houses that man has ever had are Eskimo houses for the North. I so see. that uh, what we need to do is to uh, learn from them. But we have a weakness of not learning from the natives, but rather teaching them. That's one of our great uh, weaknesses. Now, this, this puts me in mind of one of your very well-known books, the, the Friendly Arctic. Friendly to whom? It's friendly to anyone that's adapted to it. So, summers are very friendly to mosquitoes. The ocean is very friendly to seals. And uh, they are very friendly to polar bears. 
and is friendly to a good hunter, a man who will uh, put as much effort into becoming a good hunter as you need to become a good surgeon. Anybody who will do that and will then learn from the Eskimos. I mean, go to the Eskimos with the attitude of a learner. Anybody who has good eyesight and average common sense it can be as competent and as comfortable as any Eskimo. Isn't it the case, though, Dr. Stephenson, that uh, even granted that, one, one would have to be a, a superb marksman? No. You, you sh should be a good marksman. You should have patience, and you should be learn the uh, ways of the animals the way you learn the ways of the Eskimos. Yes. Uh, I have, uh, I'm not a sharpshooter, at least I would never win that championship, but I have been able to secure a hundred pounds live weight of food for every cartridge fired. During my second and third expeditions, uh, we averaged more than a hundred pounds of food for every bullet we fired. And our cartridges weighed uh, 33 to the pound. Yes. I figured that six pounds of ammunition would feed uh, three men and six dogs for two years. Six and pounds? Six pounds of ammunition. Well, now, That'd what be about, about 200 cartridges. Right. Uh, but what about all the other supplies you have to bring with you? Well, you, you bring rifles and then cameras and pencils and writing paper and field glasses. Field glasses are very uh, important. And apart from that, you don't need anything. A healthy body and a cheerful disposition. And uh, it's not difficult to be cheerful when you once learn how to uh, live up there. Well, now this raises the whole question of, uh, of food then. Um, surely, surely there's, there's some, uh, you yourself must have longed for a green vegetable once in a while. Well, I did it first. Uh, I, um, my first experience was that a ship that was supposed to meet me didn't meet me. And I had to become a guest of the Eskimos, and for four and a half months, I lived on literally nothing but fish and water. Well, we had some uh, blubber, some uh, polar bear blubber, but apart mm -hmm. from that. And at the end of four and a half months, I was healthier than I'd never been before. I and see. enjoying every meal and uh, feeling fine. And this is on an exclusive meat diet? That was exclusive fish in this case. Fish. I have since then spent more than six aggregated more than six years on red meat. That is uh, seal meat, caribou meat, muskox meat, polar bear, grizzly bear, and so on. You have to have fat with a lean. Uh, lean and fat together uh, make a perfect diet, a balanced diet. A balanced diet. Balanced mm -hmm. diet. You have everything you need if you have both lean and fat. You don't have to eat any organs. That's a, a peculiar folklore. Oh, is that we so? We feed the organs mostly to the dogs. Oh, this is where your earlier comment about uh, uh, being able to feed the dogs and the men and so on. Yes, for we usually feed. They are the organs rich in vitamins that you hear so much talk about. Yes. The dogs get most of those. I see. People don't care for them and don't eat them. Well, now, one of Except the... Except in emergencies. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, you did was to demonstrate this fact, I take it, for the first time. Is that so? Well, not for the first time. I mean, the Eskimos. <laughs> in fact, Stone Age men, I think that before the invention of agriculture, which dates back only about 15,000 years, before that, the whole world lived the way Eskimos did. I see. Approximately. Take the French cave art. Uh, the way the uh, artists show the French uh, cavemen living 40,000 years ago, that's the way we lived. Yes. Big game. Big game hunters. And, but you were the, the first of the, the polar explorers to, to uh, do this. I, uh, the first to do it on land was John Ray, R-A-E, an employee of the Hudson Bay Company. There were a certain number of men who made approaches like Thomas Simpson, mm -hmm. but the first man who became completely independent of all help who did his own hunting, built his own snow houses, uh -huh. and was his own guide, uh -huh. was John Ray. And so that, but I didn't know that. I had to learn the way Ray did, because Ray's work had never been uh, adequately publicized. At least I didn't know about it. And the only thing that was really new that I did was to go out on the ocean 
and to show that at hundreds of miles away from land, the Eskimo method and the Ray method work just as well as this on land. In fact, I felt safer on the ocean uh, living by hunting than I did in the land. And now, when you say on the ocean, you mean on the... The drifting ice. The drifting ice. The drifting ice, the polar sea. Mm. And uh, what about... How, how does one get from ice flow to ice flow? Well, um, ice flows may be any size. The biggest ice flow I ever saw was 27 miles in diameter. Mm. But when you get across any flow, you always come to the far side of it. Mm. And then, if it's touching like that, then yeah. you just step across. Yeah. But if they're not touching, you wait till they close. And when they do close, you step across. I see. Mm -hmm. And in this, in this fashion, you traveled how long? Uh, the how longest, far, rather? The longest journey we ever made took 97 days uh, and was about 700 miles of walking. This 500 miles measured on the map. This was the, the Beaufort Sea. Uh, yeah, we crossed the Beaufort Sea. If I can find uh, that. Going thing. north from Alaska and then uh, east to Banks Island. And this would be Banks Island here. Mm -hmm. And we... Um, 500 miles. 500 miles measured on the map, but, but the ice was drifting against us. We, uh, we once lost more than 40 miles when we came to a place that we couldn't cross and uh, had to wait till that closed up again. We uh, were delayed uh, seven or eight days, and we drifted backwards uh, more than 40 miles. I see. And in this time, you lived off, uh, well, I can't say off the land, no, now, no. off the ice flow. Yes. About 90% of our food was seal, and 10% was polar bears. I see. We had with us food for about 40 days when we left Alaska, and we traveled for 57 days after we left, after the food was all gone. From the oh, time yes. the very last bit of food was eaten till we got to Banks Island was uh, 57 additional days. And then, of course, Banks Island was itself uninhabited. We had then to begin to hunt, hunt caribou. Oh, yes. Well, now, uh, how many people besides yourself at this time believed that this was possible? Well, on my expedition, there were about seven. I called for volunteers, and uh, there were uh, more than uh, seven who were willing to go with me. But there were only about seven who thought that uh, we might be right. Mm -hmm. I'd like to mention that Sir Hubert Wilkins was uh, well known now. He was one of the uh, seven who, uh, who thought that it might be a sound idea. Did he accompany you on this? No, he didn't. No, uh, uh, we got separated by accident. I don't know what would have happened if that accident hadn't happened. I mean, that's too complicated to explain. Mm -hmm. But uh, he might have gone with me or might not. But mm -hmm. we got separated accidentally. I see. And you went with... Uh, two Norwegians. We couldn't get any men. Eskimos to go with us because the Eskimos thought that animal life was confined to the vicinity of land. Mm -hmm. And when they found out that we were going far away from the land, they refused to go along unless we would carry supplies. Oh, yeah. And we couldn't afford to carry supplies. So you just went ahead? And yes, I, they, two, these two men, Storker mm -hmm. Storkson and Ole Andreasen, they were both Norwegians. I see. And uh, did you run into uh, some pretty difficult times there when you were pretty low on, no, on I, meat? No, and so I think on? if you read uh, my book, The Friendly Arctic, you'll find that we didn't have any great difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, we were a little bit, uh, at times, a little bit uncertain. Our logic seemed to be faultless, but uh, human logic has often failed in the past. And, yes. Uh, but we weren't really quite sure until it's all over. But uh, I would say that the occupation of being a polar explorer who lives by hunting and has no other food except what he secures himself it's not more dangerous than being a taxi driver or, or a weekend uh, motorist, or a, a Labor Day weekend motorist. I think that's more dangerous than uh, being a polar being a polar. I Well, I, I'm, I'm tempted to say then, uh, why aren't there as many polar explorers as there are weekend motorists? But well, uh, we had, any, uh, uh, Bird had uh, 3,000 volunteers. I had hundreds, and we, uh, we paid no wages. The men who volunteered to go with me were willing to go without wages. Is that and I think that any explorer who has a, a good uh, perspective, sort of, uh, to offer uh, can get uh, the best men with no wages at all. 
This raises again then the question of, uh, of the popula populating the Canadian North. Well, the, uh, the Russians have done it, so um, um, why couldn't we do it? Uh, well, think, uh, we go as far north as what? Uh, well, uh, the biggest city, I mean the, the city that we look upon as our biggest. Yeah. I mean the biggest northern city is Edmonton. We don't think of any city north of Edmonton as big. Mm -hmm. and, Let me see um, if I can find that here. Just a moment. Oh, that everybody knows where mm -hmm. Edmonton is. Yeah. Um, north of Edmonton, or farther north than Edmonton, mm -hmm. uh, in Alaska, Canada, and Greenland combined, we have less than one million people. But right farther north here. than Edmonton in the Soviet Union, they have over 100 million people. So this would be from about the same parallel of latitude here. Uh, yeah, um, Moscow is actually about 200 miles farther north than Edmonton. And the winters in Moscow are colder than Edmonton winters, and they're a little bit longer. And uh, the Soviet Union has, as I said, 100 million people farther north than Edmonton. I see. And if, 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 if they can do it, why couldn't we if we wanted to? Mm -hmm. But uh, it isn't the... Uh, in the United States and Canada both, we are a southward looking people. Our yes. population centers in Canada are moving in the direction of Vancouver Island, and in the United States in the direction of California. But in the Soviet Union, they're moving north. And your feeling is we should be doing the it, same thing? Well, at least we could if we wanted to. Well, now, what kind of people uh, should or could successfully live in this Anybody who, anybody who has the pioneer spirit, the same kind of people that colonize the Canadian or the United States West, people who want to, uh, who want to be frontiersmen. Now we've talked a fair amount about uh, exploration and so on, but the, uh, the question that remains in my mind, Dr. Stephenson, is the one, um, why did you undertake? these arduous and, and lengthy explorations? Originally, from the point of view of an anthropologist, I was uh, primarily interested in the kind of people that live there, in their language, their culture, their religion, and so on. Yes. And then gradually my interest shifted into uh, geographical channels, and I became interested in uh, discovering new lands. Oh, by the way, I might mention the the islands of considerable size, which we put on the map, arranging them alphabetically, they are Borden Island and Brock Island and uh, Lougheed Island and Mackenzie King Island and Meehan Island, and now there's one called Stephenson Island. Oh. The government recently uh, named an island after me. Uh, those are the uh, five islands comparable to Puerto Rico in size that we added to the uh, map of Canada. Are, are you any reason to believe that there are still further as yet undiscovered no. islands? Uh, we are more, uh, we are certain now there aren't any. And this is due to what? Well, they just Lord didn't put them there. <laughs> That's up to the Lord. He didn't put any more land up there. Now, I, I grant you that, but how, how is it that we now are so sure of this? Well, we've flown all over the Arctic. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 something uh, occurs to me there. Yeah. That uh, all my islands, all our islands of the yeah. third expedition, have been mapped from the air. But there are still three islands on which human foot has never trod since we were there. We were there in 1916 on Brock Island, Mackenzie King Island, and Borden Island. And so far as I know, up to now, uh, no human foot has stood on any of, the, uh, of those three islands. But Mian Island and Lowheed Island have been visited. Now, aside from the, the obvious satisfaction uh, to you and, uh, and to the, the government when they uh, fitted your expedition in finding these islands, uh, what, what else is there about them that, that's, that's of importance? Well. If you have, if you have the, um, if you can suppose that the pioneer spirit would be revived, the same kind of people might build 
mining centers that built Denver. The same kind of people that built Winnipeg and, uh, and Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, they, uh, cities like that could be built and uh, food produced and people could live comfortably all over the north if they wanted to do so. Yes. And the great difficulty is that we don't want to. In the Soviet Union, apparently they want to. And so they are moving north. Yes. And that's a very serious thing to contemplate. I don't want to advise anybody to go north, but I think it's an interesting thing that there are people in the world that are moving north while we are moving south. I see. Now, <clears throat> I take it that under these conditions of exploration, um, one has to abide pretty carefully by the, by the rules. You have to know what it is you're about and learn, as you said earlier. And if you don't learn, the, the price is often high. Isn't that true? Yeah. Tragedy it's, can strike. Yes, it's uh, do in Rome as the Romans do. Mm -hmm. That's the rule. Do in the Arctic as the Eskimos do. Did tragedy ever strike any of your parties, sir? Uh, yes. Um, uh, a tragedy uh, surrounded particularly the island called Wrangel. Wrangel oh, yeah. Island. It's an island uh, uh, about the size of Puerto Rico and north of eastern Siberia. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we, had a, we had six ships on our third expedition, mm -hmm. and one of those ships was crashed near, near See if there. I can point it out, excuse me. Here, yes. Uh, one of our ships, the Carlock, was crushed near there in 1914, and uh, three lives were... There were um, um, 11 lives lost. Mm -hmm. Four men who asked permission to separate themselves from the expedition, Mm -hmm. and were never heard of again. The commander was, by the way, Captain Bob Bartlett. Oh, yeah. I wasn't there, and I didn't know about it for years. Uh, there were four men who were uh, camped in a tent and were apparently killed by monoxide. Carbon monoxide is one of the great dangers of polar exploration. Oh, there were three men who died of malnutrition uh, because they insisted on living on, sheep, on ship's food while well, some others lived on, on depressions. I see. Tell me, Dr. Stephenson, have you any regrets about your, your work? Is there anything that if you had it to do again, you would do differently? Well, I hope I would be a little wiser. <laughs> uh, I'd hope I'd make fewer mistakes. Uh, of course, uh, I grieved for the loss of these men, of course. but that's how it is in war, that's how it is in many other occupations. And um, I have here something that perhaps will be a surprise for you. This is the first copy of the Reader's Digest, volume one, number one. It has in it an article on Wilhelmur Stephenson. Thank you very much, sir. Good night. <laughs>